Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Zones of Regulation for Parents Managing Big Emotions. It's about, we are hopefully ready and everyone hopefully can hear us online. I keep looking at the computers for some reason. Like I'm going to see all of you people out there. Um, okay, so we're going to get started. I am Dr. Holly Briscoe. I'm one of the school social workers. Um, I'm at uh, Barstow and Calvert Elementary. And the sidekick. Um, I am Joanne Gay. Can you guys see me? I think you guys can. It's hard that we can't see you guys. Um, I am a school social worker as well. And I am at Plum Point Elementary School and Southern Middle School. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so we're just going to start um, with this quick video. It's just a very quick overview of what the zones of regulation are, um, and then we're going to get into breaking it down and really talking about it. Welcome to the zones of regulation. I'm Leah Kuypers, creator and author of the zones of regulation framework and easy to use curriculum that supports the regulation skills for learners from pre-K through adults. The zones of regulation uses four colors to help us identify how we're feeling on the inside and giving us a system then to pair all these tools that we explore into these four colored zones to support us in regulation. The zones of regulation curriculum has been adopted in thousands of schools across the world and is being used by hundreds of thousands of children ages four through 18. Whether you're new to the zones of regulation or a seasoned practitioner, you're going to find interactive opportunities for teaching and learning about the zones of regulation and extending this teaching to different age groups and populations here. Thanks and enjoy. Okay, so what are the zones? So there are four zones and you just heard Joanne and I say we're kind of in the yellow zone right now. We're gonna to explain to you what that actually means. Uh, okay, there's our little visual. So just a real quick overview. Um, there's four main zones. Um, I want you to think Goldilocks, because all is well, everything is okay. Um, you know, everything is just right. Um, and that's kind of our optimal zone in school. We talk about being um, in the green zone, being ready to learn. Um, so we're seated, we're paying attention, um, we're interacting appropriately in the classroom. Um, we have the blue Continuing with technical difficulties, but I'm going to continue. So we did uh, green zone, blue zone, yellow zone, red zone um, is that sort of emergency zone. Um, hoping that you guys can hear me online. Um, in the red zone, um, we're kind of having a hard time with self-regulation. Um, and that's the zone where um, we uh, see kids out of control with unexpected behaviors. And we're going to talk about um, what that is. Um, it's important to note that, you know, just as adults, kids experience the world in different ways. And so different things would um, influence them in, uh, in each zone. Different things will help them in each zone. Different things will trigger them to each zone. Um, so that's important to remember. Um, it's also important to remember that all zones are okay. So we all go through all four of the zones um, throughout our day. Um, you know, we just bounced out of yellow and we're in green now, right? Because we're ready to do this thing. Um, all right, so now, Ms. Gay, I'm gonna Hello, everybody. So uh, this is the green zone. So what we're trying to do when we're in the green zone is where we want to be. So like um, Holly said, there is no wrong zone. There's no bad zone, but when we're at school, or when we're doing something where we need to focus, we want to be in the green zone. Uh, and we will also be sending out this PowerPoint to you all as well. We did that last time when we presented a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago as well. So um, I love if you all want to take notes, but we will also be sending this out to you as well. Uh, so when we are not in the green zone, um, we're not calm. So when we're in, when we are in the yellow zone or the red zone or even the blue zone, it's a little bit harder for us to focus. And like uh, Leah said, the creator of the zones of regulation, it is something that we need to do to teach not only ourselves, but our children how to get back to the green zone. Because um, those of you that were here and saw me kind of pacing and all that kind of stuff, I, I was definitely in the yellow zone. And if we have a child who's feeling like that, or even me, I wasn't ready to learn. I wasn't ready to come up here and present. So I was kind of doing some of my own coping strategies <laughs> Um, to kind of bring myself down a little bit to get back to the green zone to be able to be uh, available to you all to teach this evening. 
So we're going to be going through every zone. I'm not even going to touch this. Yeah. <laughs> all right, we're going to keep doing our little dance up here. Apparently. Yeah. Okay, we are skipping that. Okay, all right. So let's talk for a more, um, minute more about yellow zone. Um, so remember our stoplight metaphor. It's where we're going to use caution. That's where we start to kind of feel emotion rise or increase. We start to have those bodily sensations that we're having a particular emotion. Um, and that's where we really need to think about what strategies do we need to put in place to reduce the likelihood of an escalation to the red zone. Um, so the better we are at, at managing our breathing, for example, the more likely it is, we're gonna be able to bring ourselves right back down to um, a place where um, we're gonna be able to then think about a choice and an action or a behavior or a word that um, would be most appropriate to, um, to the situation. So this is the blue zone, and uh, I teach this in several classrooms at Plum Point Elementary, and I think it's really important for the kids to know when they're not able to learn or they're not ready to learn, because even when we're in a lower state of arousal, as in the blue zone, we're not quite ready. And having the kids be able to say, I'm in the blue zone, that's good for the teacher, because then the teacher knows maybe you need to get up and take a walk. Maybe we need to maybe do a brain break, do something a little bit more active. Because in the blue zone, we all get in the blue zone. I mean, this is the, the end of the day. Um, are any of you guys here tired? Maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit in the blue zone. <laughs> what, you know, how much did you have to do to get here this evening, right? And also you online. I mean, you all are dealing with all of your families at home as well as trying to listen to the presentation. So we appreciate all of you. We know it's a difficult time of day. Uh, so you're not quite um, focused, not quite ready to learn. So we're trying to teach the children again to get back to what? The green zone. <laughs> okay, so red zone, state of emergency. Um, motion, emotions are not managed. It's scary. Um, and, and it can be pretty scary um, mm -hmm. for the child um, because they are feeling so out of control um, and not able to access their thinking brain. They are full on in emotional overwhelmed state, um, high state of emotional arousal, high state of physiological arousal, but not really able to access their thinking brain. Um, and that's, like we said, scary for the kid. It's scary for the uh, children was, was around there them. for a minute. <laughs> oh, you were? You were there for a minute? Yeah. <laughs> but we appreciate that now you're back into the evening. Um, but, you know, scary for um, the other kids, um, you know, other kids, get a little uncomfortable and, and when the environment gets unpredictable because maybe there's a child that is um, not managing themselves well um, and doesn't maybe they don't feel safe teachers parents um, get into um, and kind of can get pulled in to that state and that's where um, as parents we sometimes want to just we, we want to calm them down and it doesn't actually work that way um, and that's where we can get into power struggles um, with our kiddos So I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but I wanted everybody to kind of see the kind of things that we teach for the zones of regulations for the skills that we do. So um, I know that sometimes as adults, we even have trouble identifying our emotions. We're not really sure where we are and putting a color to it kind of helps us to say, okay, this is a kind of where I am. And then we can pinpoint a little bit more where we are. Um, that self-regulation. Um, does anybody know what self-regulation is? Anybody want to share? Self-regulating is being able to. Could you please see if anybody is online? I can't see. Oh, Pop over there. There is. Yes. So, um, so if you are unable to self-regulate, and if we can't self-regulate, how do we expect our kids to be able to self-regulate? And this goes for, and that's why she said, you know, infants all the way up to the elderly. Anybody yeah. can be able to do this. Um, identifying triggers. What would you guys think a trigger is? Anything. Anything. Hunger. Hunger. Yes. And actually, if you're in the blue zone, you get that hangry, right? And if you're if you're in the blue zone and you're tired, right, that's a trigger. Right. I know that I don't make such great decisions when I'm tired. I just don't. Okay. And coping strategies. We all have them whether we realize it or not. And some are a little bit more appropriate than others. Okay. The size of the problem. I work with kids on this a lot. Um, I had a child who had a new haircut and didn't have a hat and 
I thought he was going to like lose his mind. Okay. So we got him a hat. Okay. But really working on what that size of the problem is because to him, that was huge. But, you know, having him look at say, so a big problem is like a house burning down. So where are we on the continuum? Like kind of trying to teach that. And then unexpected um, behaviors versus expected behaviors. And we're going to show a hysterical video later on to show you the difference between um, expected and unexpected behaviors. So when you all came in here today and we weren't quite ready, was that an expected or unexpected behavior? Unexpected, right? It was definitely unexpected for us. So <laughs> I'm assuming it was unexpected for you guys. And for all of you waiting online, um, like again, like again, we do apologize, but it was that an unexpected behavior. And some of you might have been irritated and we do apologize. But that is what the things that even for our kids in schools, if there's a two hour delay, two hour um, early dismissal, that throws everything out of whack, especially a substitute. That'll do it big time. Can you like forward me, please? Again, like we just, what do I hit just this? Mm -hmm. okay. um, so again, we're just gonna identify some of those feelings. So how did your body feel? And I know you guys are kind of cheating because we already have it up there. Okay, but when you're happy, how's your body feel? Relaxed. Yeah, relaxed. Okay, and also just kind of like maybe even a little bit light, right? <laughs> you know, just kind of, you feel like you can kind of deal with just about anything, right? But how about when you're sad? And that kind of you know says some things up there. But how do you guys feel? And see if, if you guys want to share online. Um, Holly's kind of yeah, I'm looking at the, the chat, chat so over you know, here. So you guys are just on to... you know on cue here because so they're like, oh my gosh, I've never come into this in person again. They're making me talk. <laughs> but when you're sad, how do you feel? Tired. Yeah. Heavy. Yeah, I like that. Tired or heavy. And also, that's I think blue zone is perfect for when you're sad because you're just kind of blue. Right. And I have this little, um, I'm not sure exactly what they can see. Like, I guess I use this. It's on my, um, it's the zones on my badge. And I use it uh, at the elementary school a lot because they'll come up to me and they'll be like, yo, Mrs. Gay, you know, where, where, where am I? And they'll look at the inside out little characters here. And I find that to be really helpful. How about angry? The video is on here. No, it's on. Oh. You want me to turn the video on for them to see you? Oh, can they not see me? Yeah. So I'm, I'm talking to people and they can't they can see. Hear you, but they can't see. We are going to get this right. Oh, I see. Start well, the, well, the, fo the focus, the focus is set to the. Uh, yeah, there you go. Much better. Yep. Okay. Hi. There we go. <laughs> now it works. My oh, hair. Rotating. It just it, now. It's, now it's oh, it's the owl. Oh, oh my gosh! Now we're both on there. Wow! Can you just tell that like technology is not our <laughs> strength? I'm sorry. Okay, so again, back at the yellow zone. So, uh, so how about when you're angry? So, how do your how do your body feel when you're angry? Like, what are some symptoms that are some things that we would know that you all were in the red zone and being angry? I withdraw. You withdraw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. overwhelmed. Um, Short someone heard that online. Mm -hmm. Shortness of breath. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Tension. Hmm. Tension. Tension. My chest starts feeling tight. Mm -hmm. My stomach, like that knot. Yeah, she said her chest starts getting tight. Stomach feels like it's in a knot. And we don't, sometimes we don't even realize, again, as adults, like we don't realize that those are symptoms of anxiety or anger or even sadness. And we don't even realize it. And sometimes when we're angry, it's because we're sad or we're disappointed. Okay, how about when you're anxious? I feel like sometimes when we're anxious that it kind of mirrors some of the other feelings as well, which as adults are confusing. So how would that be to a child? Right, I think that it, as that's why identifying those emotions is so important. Yeah, my shoulders my shoulders tighten when I'm anxious. Me too. Me too. I'm actually going to physical therapy, and I was like, well, "Wait a second, why is this?" And he's like, "Oh my goodness." There was so, somebody um, in the chat who said sweating um, for anxiousness and uh, mm -hmm. frozen for angry. Um, oh, kind yeah. of, I think of that angry the iceberg. You know, where the anger is just the tip of the iceberg and then underneath of all are, are all of those other feelings. So sometimes what we see is the anger, but underneath of it is the, the anxiety or the, the stress or the overwhelmed um, emotions. Yeah, I teach uh, that anger is a secondary emotion. And I work with my kids, especially in the middle school with that, that when you're angry, that there's always something underneath. Always. Anger never kind of hangs out by itself. Okay, so how does this relate to the zones of regulation? I just pushed the button and I'm. Okay. 
I'm just like, oh. and now you guys can see me. <laughs> I did that. Oh, heavens to Betsy. Hang on. Let me try it over here. Okay, I'll get my camera. There we go. Okay. I did it. Okay. I don't know how you did it, but you did. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, but also I have the now I have all the people up there and they can't. Can you guys all see the screen? We can't see it here. Can they still see it? I uh, yeah, we can see yes, you and the and the screen. Okay. So how does this relate to the um to our body? And again, you all can't see it all up there. But again, the four zones are green, yellow, red, and blue. And um, I'm not gonna keep harboring on that. Um, so identifying triggers. So why do you think it would be important to identify triggers? So that a, so that your response to the trigger isn't as, um, forceful because it's, it's expected if you know that it's coming, or if you know that this is something that, that is, um, going to set you off, then you can prepare for it a little bit more. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And just know something like tonight, like I knew that I came in here and I was already a little like anxious about it, but I knew that we had already done this. So I'd already been with Robin here in the library. We'd already done all this. So for me, I wasn't expecting there to be any problems with the setup. Like that wasn't even like on my mind. So for me, I guess that for me, that was a little bit of a trigger that unexpected, you know, thing. So for me, I'm like, you know, can we just start this? Like I was like really feeling kind of, you know, so for me, that was a trigger that I didn't even realize. Uh, so what are you guys, what are some triggers for you guys? Anybody want to share? You don't have to, but does anybody want to share what a trigger is? Hungry, for me it's, that's... For, oh yeah, uh, sorry. For me, it's continuous interruption. Mm, yeah. Yeah, sometimes at um, the schools, I have to lock my door because I have kids that just want to pop in and just <laughs> right in the middle of a session, no matter what's going on. Do you have that happen oh, too? Absolutely. Uh-huh. Yeah, they just pop in and just want to say hi. Oh, I lost the... Sorry, that one. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. So sometimes a, a trigger can be um, just about anything. I've had kids that have um, even like, so we have 10 chats. Are you monitoring that? Yes. Okay. Yeah, those aren't there. Okay. Um, so, sorry. Oh, not receiving enough attention. Trigger getting a phone oh. call from the school or an email from the teacher. Absolutely. <laughs> I made a phone call today and I was just like, oh, this is Dr. Bristol, we have a bar side, blah, blah. And the poor parent was like, oh, no. He's like, it's not bad. I'm just calling to see how things are going. You know, it's just like, as soon as you get that call from somebody at the school, it kind of gives you go into protective mode. Yeah, I think that that happens a lot when I call parents. And the first thing I try and say is, everything's fine. Right. No problems. Because I think that in our role, that some, a lot of times we'd like to call just to say hi, like to say, how are things going? Is there anything that you need us to address? Um, that kind of thing. And also, how about smells? You think that smells can be a trigger? Huh? Yeah, like, do you guys, uh, upside down day. Uh, but pancakes, I mean, you know. Okay, so upside down day, for those of you that don't know, is um, pancakes and sausage with syrup. And I do a lot of lunch bunches in my um, office. That is a mess. It is a mess. It smells so warm. It makes me feel... Warm and fuzzy. Yeah, to me, I just, that's not, to me, that's almost like a trigger. I'm just like, it's sticky. It's going to make a mess. So here we had both had the mm -hmm. same experience, but different triggers with it. Okay. All good. Really, really appreciate you guys doing this in person and online. Much appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> we love positive feedback. <laughs> okay. So I was trying to kind of um, ad lib. So some of the things we were talking about up there. Okay. So our emotional health and physical health are inseparable. Does anybody disagree with that? I don't think that we've always talked about that. Like we talk about, you know, you're either sick or you're well, or you're happy or you're sad. And a lot of times when we're sad, it affects our body. And when we're angry, if we're describing that we're sweating, our heart is racing, heavy chest, but we just feel heavy when we're sad. You know, those are emotional responses. Like, you know, I mean, physical responses to an emotional sensation. So anybody else talk, can I think of a trigger that maybe they'd like to share? It kind of manifests through your body. Let's think of anything. My hands, like sometimes my hands get sweaty too. Um, I've had kids that say that it feels like a rush from like their toes all the way up through their body. Um, I've had some kids say that their ears get hot. I had a kid tell me today her toes curl and she gets nervous, curly toes. 
But if we don't talk about that, we don't know. And I think that the big part of the zones of regulation that I've seen when I do it in classrooms is that teachers will be like, wow, I didn't even, I didn't even know you felt that way. And if you're teaching to a child who's not ready to learn, then that's good to know because you might need to do something a little bit differently, or at least maybe pull that kid aside or say, hey, do you need to go for a walk up to the office and then come back? Because we do that. And that's fine because they're they're responsible enough, even as little guys, that they can walk to the office and come back and just kind of take that brain break. Butterflies in my stomach is a uh, oh a yeah chat. absolutely get those mm -hmm. can't sit still. And I have a <laughs> I have a child um, that told me that he's going on a vacation for spring break, and um, I don't know if any of you guys are counting, but that is what 11, 12 days away. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So not that anybody's counted, um, but if you have a child that's already talking about that trip, he may be kind of distracted, right, during the day because he's like so excited about this trip. Like every week he's like, same thing as last week. Oh, three, three people entered the waiting room. Oh. Did you admit that? Okay. Yay. Welcome, Hi, every people. Yeah, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. You missed um, all the fun. We had all <laughs> kinds of technical difficulties. Yeah, lots of technical difficulties, but we are very glad that you're here. So I think I'm popping over to you now. Okay, we're switching places. I think you can stay there. Oh, oh but your stuff's there. Here. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll stand over here then. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. So do you guys have with your children um, any type of traditions maybe that you have uh, for certain days of the week? That's right. Do you guys have any traditions? Either at first, because I think that uh, kids that I've talked to will say I, I do a, a zones group on in a first grade class on a Friday, and the kids will be like, it's pizza night or it's family game night or something like that. So those can be even triggers for kids during the day in a positive way, right? Like triggers don't always have to be a bad thing, but they're thinking about it as the day goes on, what they're going to be doing that evening with their family or what's for dinner or something like that. So, okay. Can everybody online now see again? Yes. Okay. All right. We're going to talk about self-regulation. Um, so I think Joanne asked a little while ago, what is self-regulation? Anybody have any ideas now about what self-regulation might be? The ability to recognize your emotions and then be able to react to them appropriately. Yes. yes that, that appropriately word is, is the one that kind of defines it a little bit. So it's really our ability to, um, know how we feel to manage those emotions appropriate to the situation, the environment, the expectations. Um, so we can we can have self-regulation or we can be dysregulated. Um, and we often talk about um, some of our kiddos when they end up in that red zone that they are dysregulated. Um, and so it's your ability to understand and manage your behavior and reactions to the feelings that you're experiencing. Um, we can We need to be able to control our impulses uh, we need to be able to recognize the emotions and to implement strategies to keep ourselves calm, um, whether something is exciting or upsetting. So it can be, um, you know, related to a positive thing, like looking forward to our vacation or family pizza night, but we need to be able to regulate that excitement to be able to function throughout our day um, for it not to cause disruption um, throughout our day. Um, and being able to behave in socially appropriate ways. And, you know, so, um, you know, here in a socially appropriate way, we might be behaving differently. Everybody's sitting quietly, you know, we're all listening, we've got eye contact. Um, whereas if you're at a basketball game, you might be jumping up and down and yelling and screaming. So sometimes that appropriate self-regulation is different depending upon the environment and situation um, that you're in. Um, I think we have a video on this. Yeah, no, it doesn't want to forward. You got to click on it and then. Okay, I'm going to go. Click, click on, on it. Click and on the screen and then there you go. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to click on it. And please notice Cookie Monster in the corner. If we want to work on kids on self regulation, it is humanly impossible to learn how to self regulate if no one has regulated you which means we have to do it to them or for them first before we say to them, hmm, what do you think would help you in the future? No kid ever comes to me and says, well, I think I probably should think ahead, think about cause and effect language, how this might affect me in the future, and maybe I should make better choices. No kid ever says that. 
When you ask a kid a question, how do you think you should have behaved? Do you think that was a good choice? Do you think you should have said that to that person? They very rarely come back to me. They might say no, but they very rarely come back to me with, hmm, I probably shouldn't have said that. If I had really read the nonverbal cues on their face, I would have known that I was in their space, and therefore I was outside of my personal boundary, and oh, I probably could have been punched. That doesn't usually happen. So we have to tell them this is what you should have done or this is what you should not have done. So along with teaching those values, we have to do less questioning and more direction. Stop asking kids, where have you been? Why aren't you here? Where's your book? How many times do I have to tell you? And tell them every single time what they should be doing. If we don't regulate them, they will never learn to regulate themselves. We spend too much time, and I know about critical thinking, and we should involve the kid in the problem-solving process. That's all fine and good, except that a majority of our kids don't know how to be involved in the problem-solving process, so they need more direction. Why aren't you walking? Walk. Why aren't you in your seat? Get in your seat. Every time you want to ask a question, I want you to think about changing that into an actual statement. Tell them what to do. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, Well, let me get, okay, um, we're going to talk a little bit more about self-regulation and co-regulation um, a little bit later, but that's one of the things that she's referring to in that video is um, as a parent or as a primary caregiver or even as just another adult in a child's life. Our demeanor and our self-regulation is what other people um sort of absorb. Um, so if I'm jumping up and down and really, really upset, you guys could all get upset because my uh, because of my presentation. So if I'm calm and I'm modeling that for you, more likely you're going to be calm too. And that's kind of a, a basic self-regulation thing. We do that with our infants. That's our rocking and our soothing. Um, and that's how kids learn to regulate themselves. Um, but we will talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, we have some coping strategies right now. Is me? It is me. Okay, so the zones teaches lots of different coping strategies to help kids regulate um, those emotions and to help them stay, you know, optimally in that green zone. Um, and remember what we said before: everybody's different. So what might um, soothe one person might actually trigger someone else, um, or might be overstimulating to someone else. Um, so what's the next? Okay, that's not where I want to go. Um, so deep breathing. Probably one of the most important things that we can teach our kids is how to slow down and just breathe. I probably do it 10 times a day with kids and with myself. Um, and it really works physiologically because it slows down the nervous system. It slows down the heart rate to allow access to actual cognition and thinking in the brain. Holly, just really quick. Yes. Um, especially in the middle school, I have um, a little basketball hoop in my room. And those of you, and I don't know if anybody happens to know that March Madness is currently going on. Does anybody know that? Okay, um, really big in my house right now. But do you all notice that a lot of the, uh, the basketball players before they shoot, especially a free throw, they pause and then they shoot. Mm -hmm. It's getting that focus, it's mindfulness. And a lot of the professional athletes now are really getting into that mindfulness. Not, you know, some are doing yoga, but more just a, a calmer state of mind to be able to perfect their craft a little bit more. So a lot of the kids, young and old, are starting to see, you know, wow, maybe this is something that I should check out if professional athletes are doing it. So it's something that we as parents can also model for them. Some That's of the coping strategies that that um, I was talking about. I kind of forgot that. Never worked for me, but it will for the professionals. <laughs> um, and that's a good segue to physical activity. Um, for some kids, jumping up and down on a mini trampoline will help them to regulate. For other kids, it might <laughs> it might stimulate them. Um, I was having a conversation today about you know whether or not we should have those little punchy um, bags in our offices. Um, I don't anymore because many, many years ago, I had a relatively calm child. He was feeling a little upset and he starts punching it. And he punched it so hard, it busted. And he was so dysregulated and angry. By the time that thing busted, I thought never again. Um, because for this particular child that did not release energy, it, it amped him up. And so it is important to know what works and what doesn't work for your particular child. Um, I, if I go take a run, 
can't run anymore because of my knee. If I walk, I feel better, even if it's 10 minutes. That works for you too, right? Yes, it does. Yep. Um, muscle relaxation. So that tense and release. Um, if you have, uh, I have a little um, app that I listen to at night. Uh, one of the deep breathing, you know, help you get to sleep things starts with, it might be a good idea to tense up all of your muscles to signal to your body that it's time to relax. So you tighten everything from head to toe and then release it. And it's like the tension just drains from you. Um, visualization. So, you know, kind of picture that peaceful place, you know, for me, it's the beach and the palm tree and the sun. And then I get to hear the ocean waves. And that is, um, that really works for me. And that's also relatively sensory because I'm kind of thinking about the sound of those waves as well. Um, but other sensory strategies might be um, the weighted blankets. Um, in some of our break rooms, we have um, uh, large um, bean bags and some of our the little guy the other day laying in the bean bag with just this little weighted blanket on top of him. And he was just, and he had gone from, you know, red zone all the way down to green in a very short amount of time. Just that light pressure for some kids is helpful. Um, calming music can be really helpful as long as it's not annoying. I have some uh, videos that have like relaxation um, fish and things like that on it. I love it. I put it on my smart board. But once it starts to play the same tune over and over and over again, it becomes kind of, of irritating to me. So I have to change it. Are you size or am I size? Uh, hold on a sec. So somebody asked, um, do the colors correspond to zone of regulation colors? Yes. Yes, they do. Oh, on this picture here? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. Yep. So yep. the blue is the blue zone that we talked about. And then, so they all just definitely go by the colors. So, and we use those shapes as well. Um, I have, and I meant to bring them tonight, but I was at one school and they're we're at another school. Um, but I have little paddles that I hold up with a, with a ruler that I've created um, in elementary school and to show the kids what zone we're in. So this is just something that tells you strategies to use when you're in each zone. So good question. Thank you. Yeah. And some of them are interchangeable again, just mm -hmm. you know, based on the particular child that you have in front of you. Um, and I kind of left out a few, you know, writing and journals for some kids, writing is the thing for other kids. Don't make me write. Um, drawing most of the time, you know, if I hand a kid, um, just any kind of, of marker and a, and a pen and a piece of paper, they draw, they're great. They love whiteboards. Um, that kind of thing. Do you find the fidgets are helpful? For some kids, yes. For some, it's a distraction. Um, but for some, they just keep them right in their pocket. You wouldn't even know they have them, and they're they're doing this, and and it it's releasing tension, and it's giving them a different object of focus. But it does depend on the child. I think. Uh, I have a child at the elementary school level that really wanted to bring a stuffy in, like a stuffed animal, and I worked with the teacher and him, and and we kind of went in conjunction together and said, okay, this is something you can bring in small. Is something you can bring in because stuffed animals get you know huge. Yeah. Um, so bring in a small one, and if it becomes a toy rather than a tool, then it goes back in your backpack. And I met with him earlier this week, and he was like, "I brought one in, Mrs. Gay, and it was a toy, not a tool. Mm -hmm. I had to put it away." So again, teaching that though yeah. that he can see now the difference. Oh, okay, I'm not using it the way I'm supposed to. But as a coping strategy, is turned into a toy now. Yeah, and I think teaching them how to use it and when to use it. Sort of what are the parameters around it? Mm -hmm. um, what are the rules around it? You know, so they can tell the difference. Um, but it, you know, for some kids it's, oh, I just have the squishy thing. For other kids, I, I understand that it is releasing the tension in my hand every time I squeeze it. Mm -hmm. And if we're, we need to teach them that that's um, the actual function of it. I also work with the teachers too. And I tell the kids, I said, hey, if you have this fidget, and the teacher says, you know, hey, Jimmy, I'm sorry, you can't have this fidget anymore, Susie, it's too much. What do you do? And they say, I put it away. So they have to know that before they leave my office and they're borrowing that, because if not, then it's kind of a game changer, because if they can't use it responsibly, then it becomes a distraction not only to them, but to the whole class. We love this picture. I just wanted to put it up there for a few extra minutes. <laughs> We're dog people. I don't know if you guys yeah. are or not. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so we're going to talk about size of the problem, and this is just, a, it's such a simple concept, but one that I guess I didn't ever really kind of put out there in, in concrete terms. Um, so think about your kid who you say it's time for bath, and they fling themselves on the ground and start kicking and screaming, and oh my God, you're the worst of you, oh my God, what? 
Okay, all I asked you to do was to take that. Small problem, big reaction. So one of the things that the Zones teaches, which has been just invaluable for so many kids, is to help them understand how to size a problem. How big is that problem really? And then how to size their reaction. Did you overreact? Was that a big reaction to a small problem? Do those things match? Um, so there's a lot, a lot of conversation about that um, when, we, when we work with the Zones. Um, one of the questions to help define how big is it? Is, is anybody hurt? No, then it's probably not a really big problem. Um, is, um, is somebody being unsafe? No, probably not a big problem. Can you solve it yourself or do you need help? That helps to define whether it's small or medium. So we kind of go through some a series of, of questions to help them understand how to make sense of the problem and how to, how to size the problem. Um, and I do caution kids sometimes Yes, you had a big reaction because for you right now, it feels very big, but do you understand that it's a small problem? Um, so sometimes we have to start there. They're not ready to adjust their reaction yet because in their perception, it's huge. Also with adults. And with adults too. With adults, sometimes did you ever look back at you on your reaction to something and been like, oh my gosh, that was not as big as I just made it up to be. And just like my little guy with the hat, like to him, that that was a four, right? But to me, I was thinking, you know, we're probably like more like down like at the two, but I'm talking like full out, like sitting on the floor crying. Like, so we had to like really talk about that because to him, that's what it was. So being able to say, what are your, what are the feelings behind this that makes it that? It's embarrassment. It's, you know, guilt for forgetting it. Like all of those things kind of go into play for why the problem feels as big as it does with those emotions. Yeah. Um, and this is what we're talking about when we talk about self-regulation is being able to identify the size of this problem, identify my reaction and able to kind of pull those things together and help re-regulate our reaction to meet the actual size of the problem. Um, now, does that mean that when you're in, it, it's a red side, it's a, a five problem, it's huge, like you've broken your leg. Does that really mean that you have to like yell and scream and act, you know, like, Bleh! no, you don't really have to have that kind of a big reaction, but it is a big problem and you're probably gonna cry and you're really gonna need help for that. Um, so there's still some regulation that, that um, we need to help kids understand even when the problem is big. I think we have. Okay, so I really, I really want you guys to watch this video. Don't say anything. Okay. Watch this video. Okay, we're not going to give you anything to go on except for what do you think about his reaction? You can pick up that whole thing now. All I was, Josh, all I was asking you to do was pick up those three parts. All I asked you to do was pick up those three parts. And you, so now you can pick up the whole thing. You can pick up the whole thing now. You don't get to watch TV. I want to watch TV. Gosh, stop. I want to watch TV. I want to watch TV. I want to watch TV. And I don't get to watch TV. Yeah, because oh, you... Yes, I do. Oh, yes, I do. No, you don't. Stop. Yes, I do. Stop. Josh, all I... I won't shut up. I didn't tell you to shut yes, up. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. I yes, asked you to you stop. Did. I asked you to stop. I never told you to shut up. All I asked you to do was pick up nah, those three nah, little nah, pieces. Nah, 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 nah. I want to watch David, I don't. I don't get any back from you. Yes, you do. No, I don't. It doesn't seem like I get. No, no it doesn't seem like I get. I can be a big jerk. Yes, I can. But it doesn't seem like I get respect from you. Way. Because what you just did, I don't think you get to watch TV. Yeah. Yeah, and you're not at your dad's house. Shut up! Yeah, and you yell at me for telling you to shut up, so you tell me to shut up. I didn't even tell you to shut up, and you yelled at me. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. I said I told you to stop. So why don't you shut up? I did. Hurts my heart. I think it's hard to watch. Yep.
All right, thoughts. And yes, online friends, please please uh, share your thoughts, either I'm unmute and, uh, and share or uh, type in a response. I'm, I'm assuming that was the mom, but it sounded like he was talking to his sister. Yeah. Like it, it sounded like two children talking. Okay, yep. And do we notice how it escalated? You know, the more engaged um, the adult was, um, it, it escalated a little bit more. Other thoughts? Was anybody upset by watching this? Yeah, I, I mean, I it's was painful. definitely. It, my heart started to race. Like, it's just painful to watch. Okay, so um, somebody said size of the problem didn't match. Mm -hmm. Right, but, but to him, he didn't know how to express it any other way. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later, that the child that we watched on the screen didn't know how to say that he was upset. He didn't know how to say, you know, that I feel, you know, this is hurting me. Um, she was trying to rationalize with the child. Yep, you're right, she was. And it's hard to rationalize it because what zone did you think that he was in? Red, right? And can he access his thinking brain when he's in red? No, you no, can't. No. Everybody was like, red, 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 red. <laughs> um, child needs a chance to calm down. Yep, he was definitely in the red for sure. And also, I mean, again, you guys have been angry, right? Right. When you're angry, do you really want anybody to talk to you and tell you that what you're thinking right now is not a good idea? I don't know. What's singing? Uh, I think we have another friend. Oh, okay. oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. Hello, welcome. <laughs> um, so I think one thing that you know, I, I keep saying, you know, you can't access your thinking brain. Um, um, when somebody just said saying to calm down is the worst. Okay. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that's my that's kind of where I was going. Down. I don't like that. No, no. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you just well, relax? Yeah. 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 If yeah. I could yeah. relax, then I wouldn't be where I am right now. Right. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Right. And that's no different than what we're saying to this child. Exactly. Um, yeah. How do you hold firm with a boundary if you can't rationalize during the red zone? What we need to do, do, do you want to answer that? No. Um, what we need to do is teach that child to know that he's in the red zone to begin with. And he needs to be able to identify those emotions. And I don't know what took place before that incident. Like, was there a countdown? Like, I know um, with anybody in my family, no matter what the age is, um, somebody says, talk him through his reaction. Mm hmm. Um, okay, but not while it's stuff. happening. So I think what, what we need to remember is um, whatever may have happened to trigger this, this reaction, this child is in the red zone. My job at that point is to secure the environment mm -hmm. and to make sure the kid is safe. Because anytime, if I say calm down, it's not gonna calm down. if I get myself involved, I might get hit by the, the board game. Um, the child can't think. So conversation is not going to happen. So we need to take that step back co-regulate, show them that we're calm, breathe, and let them know that they're safe. I'm here with you. When you're ready, we will we will solve this problem. I will help you solve this problem. And you just keep breathing. And I did have a kid say to me, why are you so calm? I'm just waiting for you. When you're ready, I'll be here. And it, and it worked. Um, if we had not been engaging, it probably wouldn't have gotten quite as big as it did. Um, and I know there's that fear that if you allow it to happen, are you not holding them accountable? Well, not in that particular moment, but anything you do to try to hold them accountable in that particular moment is not going to work. You're going to get frustrated and the situation can be um, can, can become worse. So- A couple of comments online. Yep, Sorry, right. Somebody said, mm -hmm. would timeout work at that time? I don't think so. I, don't th I think that he needed to kind of get a chance to get all of that out. And probably, I were, I believe more in the proactive response, kind of preempting all of this. Somebody said um, he wasn't breathing well. I totally agree. Absolutely. They were both trying to win. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about that as well, of the cooperation versus control. And um, <laughs> I said to a child, I said, you know, sometimes you know, you're just not going to win everything. And she looked at me and she's like, yes, I will. Okay, she was in, you know, first grade. <laughs> okay, so she's telling me that she's going to win. I'm not going to go up against that because it's just it's not a hill I want to die on, you know? So if, if that's the case, I'm just going to go, okay. And then I'll talk about that later because right then she's not in the place that she's going to be able to talk about it. Because if she says, yeah, I am going to win. Why am I going to go? No, you're not because <laughs> it's a power struggle, right? So I think that teaching that child, like Holly was saying, to be able to say, I'm really angry at this point and be able to calm down ahead of time and know what was, what was there, was there a schedule set up? 
some kids and adults do like I deal better if I know what's coming like I, have, I do better with to-do lists if I put everything out on the list a lot of teachers in their classrooms have schedules and when we do a two-hour early release or a two-hour delay that schedule changes and I recommend to some parents like it's really good in their own homes to have a visual schedule for kids so they know exactly what's coming from you get up in the morning you go to the bathroom you get a drink and just check it off as they go some kids do really well with that I so I, I, one, one of the things that I, that I, so we, we do pretty okay at home. Um, but, but usually it's because there are calming figures. So myself and my ex-wife were both pretty decent at this. Um, and I can usually from a red zone, set my son into, you know, light red by kind of being calming. And then from there, I can usually say, let's breathe. Let's, you know, let's, get there and then we can talk you know and the problem that i have is those don't those that doesn't transfer because we're we have had some incidents at school and it's because of these big emotions and and it doesn't seem like he's transferring what we do at home to the school setting mm -hmm. and i'm not sure how to how to make that leap is is there anything besides just continual practice that would accelerate that process well, I, I think it is really important that the school is aware that you're using these strategies. Um, some of our schools use zones of regulation, but it's not um, it's not a district wide initiative. So if you're using this at home, it's really important to communicate that to the teacher to let them know what works and what doesn't work, um, to let them know what the triggers are, you know, at home. Um, and, you know, just as we are all, um, some of us are really good at that co-regulation, some, some of us are not, um, recognizing that there may be um, adults in his environment at school um, that may be more successful um, than others at helping him with that. Um, making it really concrete and using the language of zones will be really helpful for that transfer. Um, the visuals, um, you know, if you sent um, like the little visual that Joanne has on her, um, her lanyard, um, like as a little pocket reminder, those kinds of things really help to transfer to different environments as well. Um, I, I wanted to piggyback on something else that you said too. Um, once we are, we've moved from bright red to light red and we're kind of coming down, then we do need to reflect. This is the time where we say, what happened? How are you feeling? What were you thinking? Rec helping them understand how they um, escalated, um, helping them to understand what strategies they use that work to bring them down. Um, that is all more important than giving the consequence for whatever the behavior was. That's gonna get you a whole lot further um, in avoiding that kind of situation in the future. Uh, we had somebody say, how would you approach the problem where a child is able to control with one parent, but not the other, such as being able to control with dad, but full-blown meltdowns with mom? I think that really comes down to um, parents need to be talking about what strategies they're using. They need to be using the same strategies and the same language and a calm tone. And I know that's a tall order um, because there are different <laughs> beliefs and uh, yeah, um, it's really tough. Um, it is hard one. You know, and sometimes, you know, family meetings to say, you know, here's what, here's how we're going to approach these kinds of problems. We're going to try this in our house. Ma again, making it really visual and really um, accessible. Um, if one parent has some success with it and the other parent can see it, that might help them to be more likely to give it a try. Um, I think as, as kind of inundating people with um, education about these kinds of things is really important. Um, Towards I, the end of the PowerPoint, we're going to give you guys a lot of resources. Um, like, like I think we order, there's 50 there's different 50. calming strategies that we're gonna offer you all. And I would really encourage both guardians, parents, guardians to sit down and really have a, a conversation. Like, you know, we need to be on the same page about this because I don't know with you guys that have little ones, mine are older now, but when they were little, my husband and I didn't really sit down and do that. I think looking back now that that would have been a really good thing to do because I, you know, I saw somebody here where yeah, that's not gonna happen because we were on different pages and it would have made a lot more sense if we would have kind of said, hey, you know, th this color thing might work. You know, if you have a, you know, have this and they can point to it and say, you know, this is what color I'm in. And then, cause also just like the teachers don't know, sometimes as parents, we don't know. You know, if a kid comes home from practice and they haven't had dinner yet and they've had a long day and they're just, you know, crumpled up on the floor screaming, well, they might be exhausted. 
right? And the, and we're and we're tired, so we're just you know irritated at them. So just being able to stop and think about that. Something times as parents, we need to do the same thing. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next thing. Expected and unexpected behaviors. Okay, you, you can stay there. I can stay here. Okay. Okay, so if you just have to like flip it for me. Okay. Okay, so expected versus hold on a second. It's expected versus unexpected behaviors. So we talked a little bit about that for what you guys all joined, right? <laughs> um, the unexpected behaviors. So what was the unexpected behavior this evening? You guys might have had lots of them, but just <laughs> for the presentation, what was the unexpected behavior? Technical difficulties. You got it. <laughs> you got it. Um, so we're going to show a video. And also, how would you guys feel about the ice cream falling? I bet there's some people that would make this a full-blown, like, number five big problem, right? Uh, <laughs> Your son, yeah. <laughs> right, so being able to kind of, again, scale that with him would be really important. Okay, so we're this is probably one of my um, favorite um, videos that we're going to watch. I'm ready for this, because it's pretty good. Yeah. Damn. Hope you enjoy it. Oh, where'd it go? Oh, we put it, we put it in, wait, oh, yeah, we get key back it up one. Okay. Okay. Sorry, teaser. Sorry, so then maybe now you know what the video is going to be. <laughs> okay. So um, I asked kids um, if I came in. So if you guys tonight, when you came in, and I'm, I'm going to kind of walk over here a little bit, but if I came in and I was like, hi, hi, how you doing? We're going to have a great time tonight. We're ready to go. How you feeling? How would you guys feel? You can see, you should see everybody in the room, their eyes are really big. <laughs> we don't know if we should have signed up. So even, on, so even online, like it was probably really loud, like through your computer, right? And nobody wants to be talked to like that, right? Because it just, that was something unexpected. It doesn't make you feel good. It makes you feel uncomfortable. Um, again, you know, kind of the the getting a little sweaty when things when you're anxious, like that kind of feeling. So um, again, the the dropping of the ice cream, like you said, your son would really be upset about that. So um, unexpected behaviors just don't feel good. And um, when a child does not know that they're going to have a substitute and they come in and there's a substitute there, a lot of them, especially the younger ones, have a really hard time with that. Whether I'm in the um, and honestly, whether I'm in the elementary school or it's an eighth grader at a middle school, they just don't have as good a day. And I had one child that was so excited about his um, family consumer science, like a home ec kind of class. And he was like, I'm going to get the best kitchen today. I'm going to get my kitchen so clean. He was so excited about this at lunch that that. So two periods later, fifth period, he goes in there. The teacher had to go for a meeting. So there was a sub in the room. So it, his kitchen never got graded. He was devastated, devastated. Came to me like, you know, and he was really angry. So having, but he came to me, which I was really proud of him for and being able to work through what that anger was through the unexpected behavior because he was really mad at the substitute that the substitute didn't know though, it wasn't his fault. So being able to kind of work through that and see what it, you know, why he felt that way. Okay, you guys ready for this video now? Best Christmas movie ever. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you know each cloud contains banners from heaven? Hello. You'll find your fortune falling all over town. Be sure that your umbrella is up, 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 upside down and trade them for a package of sunshine and ravioli. Macaroni. If you want the thing you love, you did it! Congratulations! World's best cup of coffee. Great job, everybody. It's great to meet you. Hi. Now come over here, boy. Sam. And every time it rains, it rains. And don't you know it's cockatiel? Every time it rains, it rains. And don't you know it's cockatiel? Sit. Sit. Uh, all over town, all over town, all over town. Make sure that you don't get up. It's upside down and we live up. That just cracks me up. Okay, so what? So what do you expect when somebody? Um, so when somebody wait, hails a cab, do you guys wave back to them? When somebody's hailing hailing a cab, anybody ever wave <laughs> back to them? Ever seen anybody do that? Definitely unexpected behavior, right? And you start to what did you guys? If you did not know the movie. Right, and you were just seeing him, like you were in New York when this was going on. What right. would you think? Like, what would you think of him? Because that's—I mean, we thought it was funny because it was a movie. We've all seen Elf, 
but what I mean mental health issues mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's and it might make you feel health. super uncomfortable like oh my that is not safe yeah and that's how unexpected behaviors feel definitely um how about the shoe shining scene you guys remember the shoe shining scene what was an unexpected behavior there you remember what he was doing laughing. yeah the laughing He's and laughing. laughing like that well, I don't know if he was happy if he was in the green zone or was he more in the yellow zone and we can't tell him what zone he's in, but to me, it, it, like, you know, Holly just said kind of an uncomfortable laughter and there's definitely a difference, right? And being overly excited, like being happy is in the green zone because we're all just kind of calm. But if you're in the, if you're excited, like overly excited like that, like he wasn't really attending to what was really going on, right? Because he was laughing so hard. So um, again, I'm not gonna keep going over this, but um, when we have unexpected behaviors, other kids or other people in general don't want to be around us. Like if I would have come in talking loud like that and had, if I just, or if I just presented like this all night. Okay. What's going on? I'm not getting any responses on chat. Not getting any responses here. What are, what are we doing? Right. You guys wouldn't want to talk to me, but there's no difference between teachers and parents, right? If we talk to our children like that. Okay, now for the fun stuff. That is not where I am. Did we change something? There I am. Oh, okay. Like it. Do you want to go back or do you like that one? Um, I can, these are collected in mine. Uh, but okay. That's cool. We can go back to the other one. Well, that requires me figuring out how to go backwards. Back here this one. Well, I don't have it back here. Oh, oh, there it is. There it is. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So I really like this. Okay. This is no different for kids than for adults. So if you look at this screen, so it's, this is the Ross Green mentality. We're going to talk a little bit about his book and we're doing a book study um, at several schools in the county on this. Um, it's uh, the book type. One of the books that is entitled by Ross Green is Lost at School. And I really firmly believe in this concept that he, te he teaches about um, and that kids do well if they can. Like our friend on the video, I think his name was Josh. Was that his name? I think so. In the video, um, he probably no, no kid wants to feel that way. Like somebody commented online here that he was having trouble breathing. Like no kid wants to feel that way. Right? He doesn't feel good. No kid wants to be laying down, kicking and screaming in the middle of the hallway. They didn't set out their day saying, "Hey, I think I'm going to do this today." It just doesn't work that way. So instead of saying he won't come to class and he won't learn, maybe he can't. So if you, if you say that you can't, you're more curious instead of judgmental. So kind of looking through all of these, can you all see it online? It's kind of tiny. I know. So, yes. um, okay, good. Okay, so um, if you look more on the can't side, um, it's a skills deficit. Okay, so if we look at a child being unable to attend versus that they won't. Okay, thank you. Somebody else said yes online too. Thank you. Okay, we need to remove some of those barriers. So if we go off of a rewards and punishment, um, that it does, a child's not going to do something unless you give them something in return for it. So if I always give a child um, candy every time they come to my room, then every time they come to my room, they're only going to want candy. They're not going to come for the therapeutic um, experience as well. So the child experiences, if you look on the can't side, they're supported. They're strengthened. They actually learn how to interact better. And it's going to affect them socially as well if they know how to interact differently. Okay, so I like the first quote down here. See a child differently, you see a different child. I love that quote. Okay. Okay, so this is Ross Green, like what we were talking about. And if anybody wants to look him up, um, the kids do well if they can concept. Um, like I said, uh, I already said all this. They don't wake up and want to misbehave. Um, and do you all agree that we need to kind of help them figure out why they're doing that? And again, um, part of uh, what Holly and I, and the majority of, like, I don't want to speak for social workers, but I'm sure the majority of school personnel want to be able to remove those barriers. And we're working in teams um, to try and do that. And that's why, again, like at Plum Point Elementary, I'm teaching this in quite a few classes. I think the link for the website might be in the PowerPoint um, at the end, I think. Oh, okay. If not, you can just look up Ross and it'll pop up. And there's great videos. They're, real, they're short little clips um, of him working mm -hmm. with kids and explaining all the different concepts. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah, that's really good. 
Okay, so this is just a raw screen quote that we liked. Um, so the essential function of challenging behavior is to communicate to adults that a kid doesn't possess the skills to handle certain demands in certain situations. So whether that was our buddy Josh or that whether that's Elf or whether that's us when the computer technology doesn't work, right? If we didn't have the skills, that could have sent me like, you know, just sit down on the floor and start crying, right? If I wasn't able to regulate. And I was getting close, Robin, mm -hmm. just so you know. I think you might have done it. I think she was too. <laughs> Probably closer than that. But trying to kind of work through those emotions, which, you know, can be really big at the time, right? Because that was definitely something that was unexpected. Do you guys have any questions about Ross Green? Anybody? It's a, it really is a great book and the, and the website is wonderful if you guys can look that up. I, I have one question. So uh, rewards and, and rewards and punishment. So I, I, I try to go by natural punishments when I can but some things just don't have a natural punishment. And it, if there is a wrong done, I feel there does have to be a punishment, even if we talk about it, even if we you know, try to come up with a strategy to not make it happen again, there does have to be something where there is a punishment set in place because there wasn't a natural punishment that I would normally kind of lean on to say, all right, you forgot your folder. This is a you problem, make sure you know, what's something that you can do in the future? I know you're crying now because, you know, you're going to get a bad grade, but, you know, this is this is something that we need to work on. How, how are we going to do this, right? That's one thing, but then there's other things where it's like, oh, you hit somebody, now we're home, and I need you to not do that, so then there's a punishment associated with that, right? But I think I totally agree with you, definitely, because and that's the way the school system works as well, and also trying to work through why it happened in the first place. So right. kind of working through that and then saying, um, I have, we have a question on here too. So if this happened, what was going on to make this happen so it won't happen again? And I'm sorry, you're going to lose this because of that. So hopefully in the future, that's not going to happen again. Okay. I just wanted exactly. to make sure we weren't doing away with, with punishments. <laughs> I just think oh, I might no, reframe yeah. it just a little mm -hmm. bit in terms of consequences rather than um, punishment, which just feels just so negative. Um, cause we don't want to, um, feed that negative cycle with these kids, um, mm. especially if they're the kid that's constantly getting in trouble. So we want to talk about it in terms of consequences. Um, you know, and it's a removal of a privilege, it's, you know, heavy lifting, you know, whatever it might be, <laughs> sure. um, but, you know, just kind of, you know, for, for our own kind of frame of reference to keep things, um, on the more positive side, um, to kind of look at it a little more like a consequence rather than a something punitive. And sure, that kind of goes you. right into this, you know, collaborate and control thing. Wait, that we're wait, talk about. We had a question mm -hmm. online. It said, what can be done with a kid who, despite lots of effort, spends very little time in the green zone? And, and um, I do know what you're talking about with this. And I think that, um, again, just trying to help him figure out how to regulate, because some kids do have a more difficult time regulating. And he might not know what the green zone feels like because maybe his body just doesn't go there very easily. And there's definitely adults that I've seen that are like that as well. And I think that teaching that self-regulation, especially if a child is young, is more important than we than we realize. And that's what the Ross Green concept is about as well. And if somebody also asked what the website is, it's towards the end of our presentation, um, we'll be giving it out. Um, I don't know it off the top of my head, but I know that we have it. Or you can just Google his name and that comes up as well. I'm sorry that I can't put that in right now. Um, but And we have a, a couple more, um, Ms. Stone asked uh, about the green zone. We have a couple more strategies towards the end that maybe we can try and work on as well that maybe that can help him. I think um, setting up the green zone might be helpful. So when I know I need to, chill out. I set up my environment. I turn the lights down. I get my PJs on. I got my fuzzy blanket. I got my puppy. You know, you set up what makes you feel good. So it's having that conversation with, with these kiddos. What does help them feel calm? And then create that space for them. We have spaces in a lot of our schools that are um, mm -hmm. uh, calming spaces, calming rooms. Um, at Barstow, every single classroom has a peaceful spot. We bought, uh, the counselor bought these giant peaceful pillows. Um, I don't know if you've heard about the little spots of emotion. That's another really, really great curriculum um, to help kids with emotions, to help them identify and, and uh, to work on strategies. Um, and, you know, so the green zone uh, kind of translates to the peaceful spot 
in that curriculum. Um, but kids know, like now we've been doing it all year long. If if I'm trying to work through some sort of behavior or emotion with the child and I say, okay, well, you know, what are your strategies? Let's talk through them. I always want to hear that they say breathing. Yep. And then we're going to practice that. And a lot of kids will say peaceful spot. Yes. So they're, they're getting a lot of that, um, at least, you know, at Barstow and at my other school as well. Um, but that's something that parents can do too. You know, really set that place up and help them identify what it is, what does it actually feel like when they're in the green zone, um, and how can we set up the environment or at least a, a small space of that environment so that they can get used to what that's like. Mm -hmm. That helps. Okay. All right, let's talk a little bit more about this um, co-regulation thing. The collaborating, so the raw screen philosophy, the zones of regulation piece, it's really more about being a collaborative parent than trying to control your child's um, behavior. And so again, it's just a reframe, um, which will just change sometimes the language that we use um, or the tone that we use with these kids. Um, so let me just double check my notes, make sure I've got everything. Um, so we think about emotional regulation. There's, you know, there's two ways we do it. We have self-regulation, but we also have that co-regulation. So we are influenced by others in our environment. And we also have what comes from, in, from the internal piece. And as I mentioned before, um, kids learn that self-regulation through that primary caregiver when they're an infant. Um, and so if um, we have a parent who um, is maybe, maybe they're living in trauma, um, maybe there's, if there's an unsafe environment and that parent is, is always, you know, on the lookout for self-preservation purposes, you know, no judgment on this parent, that child is going to feel it. The infant is going to pick up on some of the, that natural physiological anxiety. Um, and that child may um, have a little bit more anxiety moving forward and be not as able to self-regulate, even when they're in a safe environment, because they're always scanning for something that's, that might be dangerous. Um, you know, so we really, we work a lot with kids that, um, you know, come from very, very difficult environments um, and are trying to help them um, re-regulate that system. Um, so, I had a question. I don't know if you can hear me. Go ahead. Yep. Yes. Um, so I, I mean, I see in the, like in reference to the collaborate control, and I remember another gentleman talking about like you know punishments because mm -hmm. like I um so um you know I'm separated from my wife, so she has primary care. I don't see my son as often, but I do want to be aware of these things. So um. So the thing was that I noticed there's, um, she, she'll try to do, you know, like the, the timeout stand in the corner bit. Um, I, I, I've, I'm averse to that. Um, what's your take on that? Is that something I need to sort of adopt because she's the primary or? Well, um, I think, um... There might, there's value in timeout. So we, we often um, want to give our kids a break so that they can think about how they feel um, and they can re-regulate themselves. So again, it might just be a reframing of what it is when it's used is important. Um, I think uh, Joanne mentioned earlier, we want to try to minimize or you know head off some of these reactions. So if we're, we're saying, let's take a break, before we've escalated to the red zone, that, that's valuable because they're able to calm themselves and think about what can I do right now to solve this problem? Um, yes, trying so to that's, that's, that's the thing is I've seen it. So that's interesting. It's like, like it's prior to an escalation, right? Mm -hmm. It's one thing. But I, what, I've, what I've been seeing, at least the times that I've seen it used, I can't say it's all the time. Of course, I'm not always there. By the time I've seen it used, it's, it's, it's seen like the, the child was already, my son was already in the red zone. Yeah, so, and I think that's like the typical way that we've been taught to use time out. You know, I mean, I remember it was one minute, you know, for the age of your child, you know, when my kid was little, um, you know, we had the little time out chair and the little timer and all of that. Um, and he did not want to sit there. I would make him fold his hands. You know, and now I look back and go, okay, was he already yeah. too escalated at that moment? Should I maybe have not, should I have just allowed him to, you know, to kind of get out whatever it was he needed to get out? I think it's very individual to, to each child. My son was able to sit there. He was not happy, but he didn't need to be happy. Um, and it, it then facilitated, again, you have to follow it up with that re-regulating and 
conversation and the reestablishing of your relationship with, with them. Um, you know, to, to work through whatever the emotions were, whatever the problem was and to problem solve so that we don't, we can kind of minimize the, the chance that it will happen again or decrease the chance that it will happen again. Um, so, you know, I, I think, you know, communication is really, really important, even with, you know, spouses um, or, or, you know, when you're co-parenting with, and your child is going back and forth between two homes, it's really hard. Um, but sharing these kinds of things and being able to talk about what works best for your child in those settings um, and looking at things with maybe just a little different, you know, um, perspective might be helpful. And also, what what is the purpose behind the timeout? Is the purpose behind the timeout to get control of the child or to give them a break from what's going on? Um, I worked with a family where they um, had a box that had all of the things that the child liked to do in it, and he created the box. It wasn't something that I said, okay, you need to find a box, you need to put these things in it. Mom didn't do it, dad didn't do it, grandma, nobody. It was just him. They let him decorate the box and everything. And when he was really upset, Somebody would say to him, do you need your box? And he'd be like, yes. And he would go and he would take it and go to where he felt comfortable. And that could have been in his room. It could have been outside. It could have been by the fireplace, whatever. As a family, they kind of came up with that worked for him. So I think that kind of maybe from what you were saying, sir, that that you kind of rethink a little bit about what the purpose is behind the consequence that you're using. Um, because like um, the other gentleman said, it's not going to be taking away punishments and consequences altogether, because I think the children need to know what that boundary is and where those consequences are, but also the purpose behind it, because they're going to do it again if they don't understand why they weren't supposed to do it in the first place. So kind of teaching that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I think well. in, that, in that instance, uh, that's not one, the one that comes to mind I was thinking about was, uh, you know, ultimately, uh, I think the child, my, my son felt like, well, and the, the, his mother wanted to establish some control and then, you know, um, he, he didn't like it. And I kind of, honestly, in this in particular instance, I understood my son why he was sort of like not liking that. Okay. So, um, but then the, then the timeout thing, and then of course he's crying. And then uh, ultimately I just, I just picked him up. You know, and he stopped, but and then brought him brought him over to the mother, and the mother eventually just said, you know, remember to listen to mama and whatever. And then there was understanding between them, those two. I, I just kind of, but I happen to be there. And I'm not going to be there all the time. So um, the other thing too is that I'll have I'll have him. I don't have him as often, but he's tried to do these. <laughs> He's tried to enter the red zone with me a few times, you know, and then, and then I, I, I just, um, in my particular case, I just simply just, I just, I let him have his moment, and then it just diffuses, you know, and, and I, yeah, and I just say like, you know, the, like, so, you know, and back to like, you know, what, what, what did we just accomplish just now? And then, it, 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 at one point, he started laughing, and I felt like this. <laughs> Like, you know, what are you laughing at kind of thing? And then, and then at the end of it, he never did it again. You know, now I don't know if that'll happen. That'll stay that way, but. Um, well, those that's are the times and the moments where. About, where did, hmm? Go ahead. No, that's why I was sort of curious about where is this, I mean, what the timeout thing, I, I, I'm i just concerned about it. At least, at least in my particular case, I guess, but I'm just concerned about it because I know that it happens a lot. Not, not a lot, it's like a daily basis. I mean, that, that's just. This is a well, I think I would just recommend, you know, kind of re re looking at, you know, the purpose of it, um, and maybe labeling it something else. You know, maybe it's it's maybe timeout has more of a control kind of um, umbrella to it. Um, maybe we just look at it as we're taking we're taking that break because it is a self regulation break. And you know what you're saying is sometimes you can head off that that red zone. You can help him kind of develop strategies ahead of getting in the red zone. That's exactly what we want to try to have happen so that we don't need to get to that point of of letting them do that diffusion, um, which you know can be a little bit out of control sometimes. Um, so I, I think you know sometimes it really is just looking at it from a slightly different perspective and kind of communicating that language to everyone. We, we had a comment online um, that somebody said, we use timeout to calm down and think about what you did. However, our daughter gets very emotional and in the red zone quickly. 
coloring or journaling seems to help bring her back to yellow slash green. And I think that's an important thing to think about. And that's even what you were saying, um, sir, that not every child is the same. So what works for one is not going to work for the other. And um, it's funny, Holly and I both have a son and a daughter. And I don't know about you, Holly, but they were completely different. Very different. Yeah. And even um, I have a sister. So my sister, is, you know, and the way that my mom had to deal with my sister was very different than the way she had to deal with me. So trying to see that every child's not the same. So timeout might work for this one, but not for this one. You know, stuffed animals will work for this one or weighted blankets. And, and again, you know, even as adults. Like something that works for me isn't going to work for Holly. So we've kind of we've really talked a lot about this this collaborate and control, but I want to just kind of define a little bit more what what each looks like. So when we're more of a controlling type of parent um, or just adult in their life, um, it's we're trying to make them behave. You do this right now because I said so. We're we're trying to be the one who is making the decisions um, for them, which causes them to not really learn how to calm themselves down because they don't have to, because we are going to fix everything for them and control everything for them. Um, they're not really going to develop a lot of those emotional regulation skills that, that we're talking about. Um, when we're collaborative parenting, we are putting in structure, there's rules, there's guidelines, there's limits, we're communicating that. We're working with the child, not hovering over them. Um, and that really helps them to become more independent thinkers to learn how to self-soothe and to calm themselves um, when they get a little bit upset. Um, and this is really, really, really important. If you take nothing else away tonight, listen, stop talking and listen because you will hear what it is that they need. You'll he you'll figure out what that skill deficit is when we, you know, talking about that raw screen stuff. If you listen, you will hear it and you'll be able to then be much, much better at helping them and working with them. Okay. That's you. Okay, so how do you select strategies? So we're gonna give you 50 plus strategies and websites and everything. And you're like, great. How do I know what to do with them? Okay, so when we say developmentally appropriate, what does that mean? Not yeah. Um, so we said here the developmental level of the child, not so much their age, but um, where they are developmentally. So maybe, do you think that all five-year-olds can do the same things? All 14-year-olds can do the same things? No. All 45-year-olds? I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding, but not so much. Um, so we need to teach a strategy that a child will understand. Like I was talking about the visual to-do lists. Not every child can read. Right, so would it be okay to use pictures? Yeah, we use pictures in the school system all the time. That's why I have this around my neck, right? Because we use pictures all the time, okay? So, um, and I'll talk about functional. So what would you think that it would be something that's um, saying that's an unfunctional strategy? So some are distractors, seeking out a distractor, um, trying to um, bounce up and down like this when, you're, when the teacher's trying to teach you because you're trying to select a strategy that's going to work and everybody's staring at you like nobody's paying attention and and that's not functional, is it? So something functional would be making an action plan. How about maybe seeking more information? So if a child's doing that, could we say, hey, come here, bounce up here for a minute. And if we get them when they're in the yellow zone and get them to kind of bounce their way over here, instead of continue to hype up, hype up, hype up, and the teacher goes, will you please stop? Okay, because this person's jumping, now this person's jumping, now this person's jumping. So being able for the teacher to say, what zone are you in? Do we need to do something to address that? And trying to help the child figure out when I'm feeling like this, what do I need to do? Because do you guys always know what to do when you're feeling a certain way? Mm -mm, I don't think that we do. And align with family values. I think that a couple of people online have talked about this, that if you're co-parenting and you're not living in the same home, that can become very challenging. And I mean, heck, it can become challenging when you are living in the same home. Um, but to be able to be on the same page and to have those family meetings and whether it's an online email family meeting or whether it's an in-person family meeting, just to be able to sit down and say, hey, you know, do we agree with timeouts? Do we agree with a, a chart. What, what do we want to do for our family that's going to work for them? All right. Okay. You start the 50 strategies. Yes. 
Okay, so I'm gonna pick two that I like, and then Holly's gonna pick two that she likes. So the one that I like first is talk about your feelings and the size of the problem. Um, we've talked about that a lot tonight. We're not gonna um, beat you guys over the head with it. <laughs> I think you understand it. But again, I don't think that a lot of kids really get it. Um, and again, uh, the people here in, that are with us in person have said that they don't always know what to do when they're feeling a certain way. So how do we expect our kids to? Okay, and the other one is talk about upcoming transitions ahead of time. Um, I've talked about that a little bit with substitute teachers. Um, I've had kids that, that have said, um, again, if you have a family movie night or family pizza night, and then you change it, like during the day, something comes up, grandma got sick, you have to run to the, you know, the hospital, you have to go to the store, and the child wasn't prepared for that, you might be in full meltdown mode because they've been thinking about this all day. So that kind of the preparing and not kind of springing things on kids is really important. So those, do you guys have any questions about my two strategies? Pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. And again, we're going to give, you're going to have this list. So yeah. we don't need to belabor all these points, but um, I'm going to pick the one that says, say in a calm voice, you're safe right now. Because when they are in the red zone, really there is nothing else that they're going to hear. You are breathing, you are co-regulating, you are remaining really calm and you are present and letting them know they're okay. You're okay. They're safe right now. You're going to be there with them. And the other one, I'm, I'm going to pick this one because we just talked about time out. We can reframe it to time in, in a calm down corner. You can create this in your house. You can make a little peaceful spot, mm -hmm. a little green zone in your house. And maybe that's the way to, to kind of flip that, that time out um, uh, perception. It's a time in because that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to help them calm down um, in a space that is comfortable. Okay, some more for getting back to green. Um, the one in blue here says have a break box available. And um, when we send you the PowerPoint via email, you'll be able to click on that to see. Uh, and I talked about that I created with this with a family. Um, and I, to me, I think this is really neat. And I wish that I would have done this with my kids. Um, just being able to have that box with things that they wanted it. Because sometimes if your kids look at anything like my kids' rooms, you can't always find what you need when you want it. And just having that box right there readily available that if they don't want to go to their room, because I mean, the room's where you sleep, so it might not be the best place to go if you're in trouble or if you want to calm down. So maybe it is though, I don't know. But being able to get that box and take it where you need to go calm down. Because also they might not want to be by themselves. They might want to be with family, just not talking to anybody at the moment. I don't know about you guys. Do you ever feel like that? Like you want to be with people, but not really talk to them. Maybe just kind of have them there. Yeah, so that's um, one of mine. And my other one is have a consistent daily routine. Again, I'm, I'm a big proponent of those charts and things like that. Um, being able to, um, even using Velcro, be able to move things along. If you want to check them off a, a whiteboard, um, highly referenced whiteboards, the kids love whiteboards, being able to check. Um, but sometimes that can be a, get a little tedious in the chaos of the day to write that over and over again, but being able to um, just have that board where you can kind of stick things on or even see one, two, three, four, five. And also letting them know that, is it okay to kind of do this one and then that one? Yep, we don't have to be that strict if you guys are okay with it and you agree on it. And also asking the child to kind of partner with them in that routine. Now, what do you like to do first thing when you wake up? Like I have um, a kid that told me that they love when um, mom comes in and wakes them up with a nice soft voice. His dad comes in yelling at him, like, you know, come on, daddy. you know, I, that's not a way to wake up, but it might work for some people, but that's what the child kind of remembers. And we don't even think about it that way, but that's something that they said that they really liked. I'm going to go again with the modeling and the self-regulating, the co-regulating. Um, the more we model calm behavior, the more our tone is calm, the calmer they will be. Um, it's a proven fact. Um, and the other thing is um, that over on the other side, offering snacks and drinks, make sure their basic needs are met because very, very often we just have kids that are just exhausted and they need a 10 minute nap and they are okay after that. They're hungry. Yeah, and kids are coming hungry. Boys, my mm -hmm. goodness, they can be calm <laughs> and they, I mean, they need to. Um, I have discovered that I need to keep snacks in my office because these kids, they're just hungry. Um, so think about, you know, we want to double check that basic needs have kind of been met first before we start to really look at what other causes um, of the behavior might be. Okay.
Okay, here's a couple more. Okay, so my two are give a compliment. Okay, I think that that is really um, not looked upon as heavily as it should be. I, I've noticed that when you say to a kid, you know, wow, you're really doing a great job at that. They're like, really? But I just don't think that they, you know, always hear that. Or maybe they hear it and just don't accept it. I find that as well. And actually holding their hand. And you'll know with a kid, if you put your hand on their back or their arm or try and hold their hand, they're like, what are you doing? Okay, they don't need to be touched right now. But also if they're maybe in the blue zone or the yellow zone, just saying, you know, do you need a hug right now? You know, or maybe just kind of just touching their hand a little bit just to let you know that they're there. You know, and I, a lot of times I ask permission before I do that to say, you know, would you like me to touch you right now? Is it okay if I touch your arm right now? Because sometimes that gives them a little bit of control because a lot of kids in, in our schools, you know, just in school in general, um, don't have a lot of control. So being able to say yes or no to that, it's important. Um, research is, is out there that um, touch, because it produces that oxytocin, mm -hmm. is evidence-based. It does calm people down. Um, now, taking aside the people that may have, you know, trauma, that would be different. That's why we would always ask, you know, permission first. Um, but, you know, in a, in a typical human being, um, touch is something that brings our nervous system down. Um, so I like that one too. Um, I'm going to go with taking them for a walk because new research is out that and there's lots of new therapies out that taking your kids or, you know, your, your clients outside and doing your, um, your therapy sessions in, um, a natural environment and grounding yourself in nature with sunlight and puffy clouds and, oh, look at the green leaves on the tree. All of that is shown to slow down and relax that nervous system as well. Um, so I'm actually looking forward to learning a little bit more about that. Um, but just, you know, going outside and getting that that hit of, of cool air right now and the sunlight, it improves mood, um, which will improve behavior too. We, say, we had a question really quick. Oh, okay. Um, we had somebody say, um, for removing triggers, what's the best way to help a child understand, know what their triggers are? Or is this for the adult to figure out? Um, I, that's a very good question because if it's for us to figure out, wow, that's an uphill battle for sure. And sometimes I, I do agree that kids don't know it because I'm not always sure what my triggers are. Um, so I think just kind of walking the walking through life with them and just maybe noticing um, the uh, woman that said that she her child isn't in the green zone very often, that her that child's triggers may be very long. So maybe even writing them down to see you know, exactly what are they and what can we do <clears throat> to kind of try and maybe intercept that because the child needs to eventually know as well because they're not gonna be with you all the time. So they're gonna have to see, you know, okay, when the teacher you know, plays um, dream box, I can't stand the way that sounds. And that's a trigger for me. And we've had kids say that like the mm -hmm. voice on some of the computers, they just really don't like. So um, things like that could be a trigger for them. To being able to figure it out that so way. So one of the things we do in um, cognitive behavioral therapy is we look at antecedents, behaviors, and consequences. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm talking with a kid and trying to help them understand um, how their thoughts, feelings, and actions connect, we're talking about what happened before you felt that way. What happened before that? What did you hear? What did you see? What did you smell? Um, that's a way to help them kind of dial back away from the emotion a little bit and get it a little bit more into their thoughts and think about, okay, well, oh, I didn't realize it was the, the voice on the com computer that really triggered me. But in having those kinds of conversations, what came first? What was the antecedent to that feeling or that behavior? It helps them to, to identify those things. And it's a collaborative process, right? You're going to notice some things that they're not going to notice and they're going to you know be able to notice some things. So it, it's definitely, um, that's part of that collaborative communication to have with your kids. Oh, sorry. We just had a question online, sorry, that said, um, what if the trigger is school? And mm -hmm. that's a toughie because we have mm -hmm. children that have, you know, 40 plus days of yep. being absent and um, because their anxiety is so high because school is a trigger. So being able to, I think that working in collaboration with your school to try and figure out the best way to help the child manage whatever it is that they're feeling within the school is going to be key. Yeah. For sure. And I think and maybe that we could even reword. It's not necessarily removal of triggers because right. we can't remove all of the triggers out. in our world. It mm -hmm. is managing them. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's changing the way that we're thinking about them um, 
reframing things, um, inserting something different, you know, how do we find a way, you know, to help kids understand that school is safe, you know, that, that sort of thing. So we're working with a lot of those kids. So if, it, you know, it, it, it is absolutely, that is very, very for real. Um, but just know, like, it's really not necessarily removal of triggers. If we can get rid of them, but it's probably usually management can't. of yeah. them because life is what it is. Yeah. And unfortunately, even as adults, we're going to see those triggers and, and struggle with some of those things. So being able to teach them that when this happens, when you have to go to a place, because I'm going to assume that not everybody likes their job on a daily basis. So sometimes we have to go, I mean, I do, I'm just saying, but um, <laughs> so sometimes we have to go to places where we don't want to go. Um, some people can't stay in the DMV, right? So, I mean, just where we have to go to the dentist, there's definitely triggers. So maybe being, hopefully the, the, my hope is with the zones of regulation that we can teach children and their parents that when you do something that kind of slides you into the yellow or the red zone, that you'll be able to find a coping strategy that you can help to calm yourself down to hopefully get you back to the green zone as you're experiencing that trigger. And the more success we have with managing our emotions and then feeling successful, the less that trigger is going to stimulate a big emotion. So once we realize that we can present in public and not completely freak out, I could not have done this when I was in college. I actually dropped classes when I was in college, but I've had to. So I just did. And oh, working through all of the, the hot sweating and all of the, the anxiety that comes with it, I really don't have it very much anymore. I get a little queasy anticipating it, but once I get going, I'm okay. And it's just from experience, having success, surviving it knowing that you can do it and that builds on itself. All right. Next. Oh, okay, so we are going to talk less, as Holly said, and practice more. So you guys see the picture there, and this is something that we um, say to a lot to the kids. So we're going to have you guys all do it here. Um, I'll do it here, but hopefully you'll do it at home too. So smell your flower, hold your flower up, right? Smell your flower. And I want you to blow out your candle. Thank you for coming. Thank you. We have somebody leaving. Okay. okay. So again, just kind of, and we can have the child do it again. I have some kids do this. Yeah. yeah. They're going to hyperventilate. Just and okay. they hype themselves up. Yes. Um. So yeah, I have somebody say we have a pinwheel to help with breathing. Yes. I have pinwheels. I just in made my a office. pinwheel today. Yep. Yep. And that's definitely why I'm going to take it into the classrooms next week, actually. Um. And we're going to be doing pinwheels because that's a really good way to say, you know, the kids going, <laughs> Pinwheels don't work. Okay. So being able to slow your breathing down. And we also do something called an eight, right? So um, to see here, so you go up with the eight, go like this up. And you're doing what's called, you know, the lazy eight breathing. And I'm um, and the more you mm -hmm, up and down your fingers, a star, as Holly's doing right there. And you, the faster you do it, you can almost make yourself anxious. So being able to role model for children that we our breathing is key. And again, that kind of goes back to mindfulness and just even breathing like the professional athletes, like I said, you really have to just slow down. And I think that in our society, we don't do that very well. So it's kind of, a, I don't, I mean, it kind of makes sense that our kids don't because they never see it. Right, because I mean, anything that they watch on TV is instantaneous and it's fast. All right, we're gonna do a few resources. I know we only have about a little less than fifteen minutes left. Yep. Um, are you gonna pick one of these? Or not? Yes. How about if I just click on one? What do you want to do? Okay, so the one that I want to talk about was the social think one. So you can do the one at the bottom. Okay, so um, this is a free step-by-step -step guide. There's also some, um, there's, there's online training, there's products you could buy, there's articles. Um, I really thought that this was really cool. Um, the Zones Online, which is one of the resources, is not free. Um, so you can look at that one, but just so you know, it's not free. We didn't want to give you something where you had to pay for it. Um, but there's a guide to making your own Zones of Regulation check-in on this. Um, and there's also various webinars to view and things like that. How am I going to get back to the so PowerPoint? You can actually move that black bar to me too. Drag and drop, drag it so you can get down up to the tabs at the top. Oh, I can, okay. Yeah. Like that. Sorry, everyone. More technical. I'm learning so much. Yeah. There we go. Woohoo! Okay.
and we're going to move that back. back. <laughs> let's move it over there. Okay. Okay. You can okay. go to the next one. Um, let's see. So again, when you all get this PowerPoint, you'll be able to click on them. Okay. Um, so you pick one. So I'm going to click on the zones of regulation, teaching resources at WordWall. I have just discovered WordWall. It is so cool. Completely free. Um, I think you probably can pay for um, a subscription to it, but I mean to tell you, these kids are so engaged mm -hmm. in these games and it's not just zones of regulation games on WordWall. You can just go to wordwall.com and then type in, um, there's, there's a little box just on the plain WordWall website, emotions. I typed in um, perspective taking, anything, and they have all these games. And then you can um, you can change the so I can change the template over here to make it something different. So I can make it a random wheel, so to speak. But this is I got kids that love this game. So I am sad that my friend is not at school today. What zone am I in? So, or you can even do that. Just quick, I'm gonna show you and then I'm gonna close it. See, you spin, you get a question. The kids love it. And I have a big, um, oh, okay. Was not trying to do that. Okay. All right, it's just fun. So I will now. <laughs> move that and go back to where we're supposed to be. Okay. Okay. So just to kind of wrap up a little bit. We have about 10 minutes left. We want to honor everybody's time. Um, I know everybody is tired. It's been a long day for sure. So this is just an overview, just to remember that no zone is bad, just like no feeling is bad. And when I first go into classrooms and teach about the zones of regulation, I say, is there any zone that's bad? They all go, yes, the red zone is bad. It's scary. It's bad. Well, we all get angry though. Right? We can't help but going into the red zone every once in a while. So being able to teach them that it's not bad. We just need to know what to do when we get there. Okay, And that our zone is defined by feelings and internal states that we experience. I think we've definitely covered that. I'm not going to read all this to you guys. We um, talked about it quite a bit. Um, and again, somebody talked about consequences and punishment. Um, I don't think that we should say, you're in the red zone, so this is going to happen to you. Because then that makes the zone bad. So being able to kind of work through that to figure out why they're in the zone that they're in. All right, a quick Q and A. If anyone has any other questions, we've got um, about ten minutes. Right? And also, here's our contact information. If you guys have any questions that you didn't want to pose in front of the group, or if you want to get in contact with us, um, we'd love to hear from people. So, okay. Any questions? One of the things we do at our house is I saw there the offer to. Help Can you guys hear? Yes. The offer to uh, what? Help with a task. Mm -hmm is um, my son is six and he's autistic and has ADHD. Uh, so like my husband will come in and tell him, you know, toys are over there, okay, clean up your toys. Mm -hmm. And he can't, he can't, he just can't do it. It's impossible for him. So I always say, well, you know, let's set a timer for 10 minutes and I'll sit down and help you with it. Let's mm -hmm. see if you can finish first. Mm -hmm. And so we make it a game. And mm -hmm. we get my husband. So my husband, he still, every single time yes. come in and say, pick up the toys, I'm like, he can't right. because he can't pick that first item. Right. So you're on that can't versus won't. It's not that he won't. It's that right. he he doesn't have the skill right now. And right. you're teaching it to him by making it a fun game. You're collaborating with him to, to help accomplish the task. Mm -hmm. Great. And again, trying to work. I just I can kind of see what you're saying underneath of that, kind of just not being on the same page. Right. As well. Mm -hmm. So trying to being able to, to have that collaboration again with you know, when you co-parent. With somebody to be able to say, how do we do this? So you're not punishing when I'm trying to work and more collaborate. Well, my husband was, uh, he does very much that. But when, when I was little, my yes. parents did. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I've never been to parent. I have a 27 year old and six year old. And so <laughs> I created them. Uh, but it, it's one of those things I've kind of already been through this before. It was also another child that had some special needs and everything like that. So it's how I first grew you. And it is for him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and I've also with the things being a mom, I was able to take some like classes through and some toddlers, yeah, certain things. And I learned some little tricks, like instead of saying like um, like with the the overstimulation and stuff, it was, it was the flipping the lid. Mm -hmm. Yep. Where, mm -hmm. You know, if both of you are losing it. There's not going to be anything happening. So, 
Um, but it's still easy. It's even difficult. Sure. Of course. Sure. Oh, yeah. I'm still learning. Yep. And I think that that's like giving ourselves some grace, mm -hmm. I think is really important to know that when you guys get home tonight and you've been here and your kids are like, you know, oh, you're home. And you're like, I just been sitting for two hours and listening to all this and I'm really tired. You know, that that's going to be really difficult. And just kind of saying to yourself, that's okay. Yeah. You know, I can, I can be tired. And I think that also teaching your kids, you can say, you know, hey guys, I'm tired. You know, I just need a moment. Can we just sit down and maybe we can talk a little bit and then we can go to bed. Because just being able to just kind of acknowledge those feelings and not realizing that they're wrong. So one thing that I just realized is we were supposed to have given you a pre-survey, which oh, once again, I didn't do. <laughs> um, I really would like to give you the survey. I hope we have some people online that would be willing to stay. It's not very long, I promise. Robin, I'm going to need your help to copy and paste it and make it happen. Um, we can keep doing question and answer while I'm doing uh, that. But... Thank you both very much. This was great. I know some parents who wanted to attend, but were not able to. I can will share the PowerPoint. Um, will they be able to access the video as well? Well, it's funny that you asked that because um, Howard County School System is going to put it on their website, which Holly and I were a little Microsoft. But, you know, <laughs> you guys all see it anyway. It's being recorded. So um, I just put it, it will be online here. for everybody to view. So if you want to forward it or if you just want to um, direct them to the website once it's up as well. Please keep asking questions while I find this thing. Yes, I can't see the chat, but if you want to talk, we can still talk while she's putting this up. I echo what was said. Um, this presentation has been invaluable. Um, really appreciate um, the library and uh, you ladies for um, offering this to, to parents. Um, it has been extremely helpful. Just really want to thank you. Oh, great. Thank oh, you. Thank you very much. I'm getting yeah. there. I'm getting yeah, there. The, I'd like to say to you that um, going, you know, I'm, I'm not a new parent, but I do have two children and there's a fairly big gap between the two of them. One is 14 and one is two. And I'm learning how to be a different parent because I've learned how to be a parent from my parents. And there's a lot of things that they did um, that when I come to things like this, that I realize that I'm like, oh, well, that's why I'm messed up. Okay. All right. I understand now. So I just wanted to say, yes, thank you. This is, this information is really good because it helps you understand, you know, your kids. And I always say, you know, they don't tell us how to raise kids, right. but now they don't, they, they don't. don't, you know, and you just do the best you can. And that's how I feel with my eldest. I'm like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I did the best I could, but. Well, and we now. all naturally fall back on the way we were raised. Yeah. Like, that's what we know. It mm -hmm. is, you know, the way that our parents raised us and they did the best that they could. Um, and we're all always just trying to learn to, you know, to, to improve a little bit more. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So this information, like I said, I'm just, I'm chiming in as well. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Oh, thank thank you. you. And please click on the link in the chat and fill out the, um, the survey. What can we do for our friends here? Um, did you print any out? I did not print any out. <laughs> I did not. Do you guys want to click on the, oh, do you mind? Go. That'd be awesome. Thank you. It's really short. It's really short. And we appreciate the feedback because we do want to continue to do this. If people want to see it again, um, we'll continue to do it. Maybe we can do it over the summer. Yeah, be during the day or something. I know if, if the library and Robin are willing to have us back with all of our technical difficulties and everything else, we'll see. I, I was just going to comment that you two are also not just brilliant, you know, all this amazing stuff, but you're also great teachers and you taught in such a way that those of us who've been parenting for a while and know that we're making mistakes don't feel judged. We feel like, okay, you're teaching us something we can, I don't know, you have the perfect amount of grace and makes us well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. That, that's important to me. It I'm, is, really, yes. I'm really glad yeah. that you feel that way. Thank you. Thank you. It's hard. I mean, this isn't, you know, I used to tell my kids that they, you know, they don't come with instruction manuals, no. right? So I think that it's, you know, sometimes it's easier to run the dishwasher than it is to parent, I think, sometimes, because it's just <laughs> like, you know, geez, you know, when something comes up and also having two kids that are completely different or, you know, a huge age gap, so where you really feel like you're ready and the other right. one's like, you know, hey, I'm over here. Um, it's, it's difficult, yeah. for sure. 
So we appreciate all of you all seriously for coming out and for um, participating and being willing to learn. Yeah, so thank absolutely. You. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Okay. As long as don't thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great way to think. Yeah. I, um, I have a question. I have a high schooler and I, I joined late, so apologies, but what kind of focus? What kind of focus? I know I heard a lot about the younger ages, which I also have. Um, and it starts at a young age, primarily from what I've noticed with my kids. But what kind of focus um, is different or is um, given to for the teenage years in the same topic? I think the zones can apply to all oh, ages yeah. and to adults as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, my my experience professionally in the schools is really elementary school. So that's why I give a lot of those examples. Um, but, you know, she's got, you know, a, a middle school, um, and, yep. you know, and we both have adult kids. Um, and I, you know, could, mm -hmm. you know, I really wish I had known this language um, when my kids were growing up. Um, Cause I would mm -hmm. say my daughter was probably in the blue zone quite a bit. Um, and I didn't necessarily know to help, um, you know, label that for her. Like I knew it, you know, I, been doing this for a long time, but you know, with your own kids, you don't necessarily recognize those Very things true. that much. Um, you know, and so had I, it's a language that you use, and had you know, had we you know been more able to kind of communicate with that language, maybe would have gotten a little more out of her because she was not a big communicator. Um, and I think that my daughter was in the yellow zone quite a bit, and she still talks about being anxious and um, having to work through some of the anger. And she she goes into the red zone. When she goes into the red zone, even at twenty one, I can't talk to her. Mm -hmm. um, because, and that, trying to teach her, you know, when you're angry, you can't go out and be in a society like that. Like you can't, you're going to lose jobs. Like, so it's just that, I mean, again, I think that we're sitting up here just being real with you guys as well, that it, it's not easy and being able to teach even our adult children now, like when you're in a relationship, you can't, you know, bite the head off of your partner because, um, they're not going to like that. And so whether you did it to somebody and you lost friends that way, um, now being able to revamp and take a step back and say, look before this and why did you get angry? Sort of what Holly said beforehand, those precursors are so important to know what exactly happened before you got angry, you know, and just knowing whether you need a break or not. And if you stub your toe and you're like, okay, that's not everybody else's fault. Okay. Why don't you take a moment and then we'll talk and then getting to know her a little bit better that she can say, when that happens, I'm like, okay, I noticed that you got really angry. Would you like me just to leave you alone? Or do you want attention when that happens? And she's like, I just need a minute. But if I would ask her that in the moment, I'm getting cursed out, right? Because right. she's 21. So, you know, so I need to know now, even as an, an, a parent, how do I deal with that? Yeah, it might actually even be a little easier. I use that term loosely with older children because they have more verbal skills and are, have a better ability to reflect on themselves. Um, and on situations than the younger kids do. You know, we're dealing with, you know, early development when we're dealing with the younger kids and they just simply don't have the emotional language. They simply don't have the ability to self-reflect until they reach um, older, you know, developmental stages. So in some ways, using this with um, high school age kids might be a little, um, again, very loosely easier because of those communication skills. Well, they also have the natural process. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's why they're able to reflect. Yeah. That's why they're able to. Because they know this guy thinks that it's closer to 30. 27. Yeah. Yep. My kid's going to be 28 in, oh, next week. <laughs> He's there. Uh, when I was at the middle school full time, I had the zones up on a board and the kids would come in and I had their names on like an inside of a post-it. So they would come up, it was magnets. And they would put it up on the board like this, so you couldn't see what their name was from the back. And they would put up where they were and what zone they were in. And even like not having a full fledged sit down, talk about what the zones were, just like quick down and dirty. This is what the colors mean. And they learned that what zone they were in. And if they were in, say, a red or a yellow, I would try and touch base with them throughout the course of the day. Or I could let somebody know to say, hey, you know, this guy's not doing so well today. Can somebody touch base with him? And it was, I think it was invaluable yep. to be able to do that, especially coming out of COVID and being able to see like where these kids were. Yeah. 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 We actually had some um, elementary school teachers that would do the exact same thing with popsicle sticks. Yeah. You come in in the morning and mm -hmm. put your stick in, you know, whatever the, the color bucket was. And that teacher would then know 
okay, this, this one's in a good place and I need to go maybe give this one, you know, a little bit of, of attention or, you know, offer a break or whatever. Um, and, you know, they could move them throughout the day as, as those, um, as their zones change. It's just such a good way to communicate. And sometimes it's hard to say, you know, I'm sad or I'm angry, like, you know, kind of putting those words on it is difficult, but if you can say, I'm feeling kind of blue, I'm feeling kind of yellow, you know, it just, it just seems a little bit easier to me to say what a color is, even as an adult, than it is to, you know, so worth a high schooler, it might be something that they could do. I mean, they wouldn't want something, you know, juvenile, like, you know, right. saying, yeah, but, we use a lot of them. You know, what, what's that movie? Um, oh, Inside, Inside Out. Out. Yeah. yeah. Little kids. No, okay. I know, That's I know. Fun. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that it's seeing that the brain, like in the brain, they says all the little like different people, and in the brain they flip to which one they are, mm -hmm. and also to realize that you can. And I have kids that say, "Well, what if I'm in two zones at the same time?" You can be like, there. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think you know, Robin and I we were doing this. I think that I think you and I have a question about you. You had it a little bit better. We did, but I think Robin and I were kind of go between yellow and red a little bit. <laughs> we're light red. I like somebody like, go coined the light red. I think I'm going to use yeah. the light red again. I like that. Yeah. Um, but I think that just acknowledging that that's okay. And when I go home, I think I'm going to be in green and blue. <laughs> so be tired. Oh, okay. I don't know what I'm doing right now. I thought I was going, I thought we had another. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so we will share the PowerPoint with you via email. And do you have everybody's email here since they registered? Uh, yeah, I think that's what we did last time. I think we shared it out that way. Yep. Um, and I will also say there are tons of videos online mm -hmm. um, that have been made um, about the zones. Um, there's lots of video clips from Inside Out that mm -hmm. go through and, and show you. We actually had one in here and we ended up taking it out um, just because it was just too long because we talked too much. Um, <laughs> we took a lot of the videos out and talked more than watched yeah. videos this time. Um, but yeah, if you just, if you click, you know, just type in zones of regulations video, um, type in Inside Out zones, that sort of thing, it, it all the stuff will pop up. So, you know, and that's a good way to teach your child about yep. this is, you know, to, to find, they love the videos, they love the YouTube. Um, and so I'm not sure what that, is that person okay? I'm not sure. They just waved. Yeah. Out there. And it, it was an intense wave. Yeah. Um, so if you guys so, yeah. still want to ask questions, we can stay. If you guys want to go, we want to honor your time. Yep. So thank, thank you is. very much. And thank you for completing the survey yep. as well. Um, we appreciate all of you guys. We know it's late and thank you. And if you do want us to do it again, let us know. Yep. Yeah, I think maybe a daytime one over the summer.